Hi everyone, I'm back in the studio with Matt Lizzymore, who's the Lifestyle Magazine Drive Editor, and Steve Huntingford, the editor of What Car Magazine. And we're here to talk about new car technology and innovation. Now, if you have a question for them, don't forget to submit those questions now. Steve, Matt, welcome. Welcome to us. <laughs> Steve, I'd like to start by asking you a little bit about yourself and also what it is that you do at What Car. Yeah, so yeah, I am uh, I'm always love cars, which is why I'm lucky enough to do the job that I do. I'm, so I'm an editor of What Car, which basically means I'm responsible for all the editorial output from What Car. What Car, for those who don't know, it's, it's well, it dates back to 1973. It's the biggest selling motoring monthly on the newsstand in the UK. It has about 2 million unique users on the website. And it's basically about a third of Britain's car buyers use it to help them choose their next car. Really? Which is quite rewarding, obviously, because you feel like not only you're getting to do something you enjoy, but actually also you actually are helping people to get, hopefully, the right car for their needs. Absolutely. And Matt, same question. Yeah, much like Steve, I love always loved cars um, so these I've been writing about cars for 12 years now uh, currently I review cars for the Motability Lifestyle magazine so the magazine you receive if you're a Motability customer uh, which is very interesting because we get to look at uh, I do lots of measurements for the cars to see whether uh, you know a scooter would fit in the boot or in a wheelchair and that kind of thing so it's a, it's a, a slightly different take on, on a traditional car review which is uh, it's been interesting I've learned a lot doing that and, and met some very interesting people brilliant Steve what are the most or some of the most exciting technological advancements that you've observed in new cars in recent years and how do they advance the driving experience? So we have seen big difference, big improvements in terms of, for example, the amount of autonomy in cars, not so that they drive themselves, but so that they assist you with the driving. And it's quite variable. Sometimes those things are actually very helpful. It tends to be when they're not that intrusive, they sort of catch you, help you out, take the strain out of driving, but they don't overly intrude. When they do, it can be quite frustrating because then you end up, people end up switching them off and they become, as we say, not doing the job they're meant to. It's probably the biggest change that we've seen over the last few years, though, is the rise of electrification in cars. Um, obviously, electric cars still you know a relatively small portion of the market but 16 and a half percent last year and, and so yeah ultimately that is where we're going and, and seeing the advancements in electric cars that's been fascinating because i, rem I remember say so 2016 where they represented like less than one percent of the market and they were terrible okay. absolutely <laughs> terrible they, you know, no way you'd recommend these things yeah they were dangerous they had terrible ranges whereas now they are yeah, they're getting five star safety ratings so do two to three hundred miles on a charge they're great cars Brilliant. And Matt, with the rise in popularity of electric vehicles, what developments are you seeing with the battery technology? Yeah, so most, uh, most of the advancements in battery technology are, are currently focused on energy density. So effectively, uh, that's, that's all about improving the range, which I know is a, a, a big concern of people. Mm -hmm. um, in some, time, in some ways, it shouldn't be as big a concern as it is. As uh, Steve mentioned during our, our talk earlier, the average miles per week is around 120 miles per week that, that the average per driver covers in the UK. Uh, and we, most of the cars now can do between two and 300. So, wow. you know, there, there's a decent amount of range there. But people want more. And if you're going on a long journey, it's understandable that you want to get there without having to stop and charge on the way, uh, particularly with the accessibility issues with public charging. So yeah, most of the, uh, most of the advances we're seeing are around the batteries themselves. Uh, and that comes in a, a couple of forms. One of them is sort of the, the composition, so the, the different chemistries involved in the battery. There's a couple of different reasons for that. One of them is to make batteries cheaper uh, and use fewer of those sort of scarce materials. Uh, and the other is, as I say, increasing energy density. And then uh, I think the, the, one of the big technologies that's just on the horizon, I think Toyota think they've got a solid state battery which is about four or five years away. Okay. I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, but solid state batteries are another big one. And, and the, the implications of that are much bigger range. They're quoting 600 miles for, oh, for wow. their prototype uh, and charging within about 10 minutes. But, you know, we're, I'll, as I say, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of people focusing a lot of energy on that. That sounds amazing. Now, I know everyone has concerns about the ability to find public charges. What are your thoughts on how quickly the charging infrastructure is growing? Do you want to, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is growing. Uh, and it is, it is growing reasonably quickly. I, I, think the, um, I think the bigger issues are the reliability of the, we need more reliable chargers because a okay. lot of the time uh, that you, you get to somewhere where you know there's a charger and they're just not working. Uh, and that's really frustrating. Yeah, particularly if, there are ways you can check, in fairness. There's lots of uh, excellent apps like uh, ZapMap uh, where you can see where chargers are. You can see whether they're working. People can leave comments and say, oh, do you know what? This place isn't very accessible or actually it's really cheap and the charging was really easy. So there are ways around that, but it just involves preparation. And sometimes if you're just out 
on a whim and, yeah, and yeah. you haven't you know you haven't had time to do that preparation it's not ideal so i think uh, the reliability of charges is something that needs to improve but in terms of the the number and availability it is growing we're seeing more uh, ultra rapid charges mm -hmm. uh being rolled out which which means you can if you've got a compatible car you can in theory charge to 80 percent within about 20 minutes which okay. is very very good yeah. assuming you have a car that can do that um so yeah it, it is increasing but uh, as i say i think the uh, rural areas are a bit of a problem and, and it's the reliability of the charges that also needs to be improved thing, you know, yes you can check yes there are apps that let you check but you know if if we're going to persuade more people to go to electric cars and then yeah there are good plenty of good reasons too you don't want it to be a, a, i feel like a step back from what they've got now yeah. right and that's the thing obviously you don't need to go before you set up on a journey well i'll look for where the petrol stations are and if they're open yeah. and yeah. so that's that's the sort of thing and, and it definitely is I remember some we did a test recently where we were so we were looking at whether it's how the, what's the most efficient way to complete a journey and the fastest way to complete a journey not by racing but driving at limits but whether you charge up to 50 percent or 80 percent so the way batteries work actually although you, you'll often see maximum charging speeds quoted they don't charge at that speed for the whole time after 50 percent they do slow down quite dramatically oh okay um, so we were the, we, we, so we were looking at we had two identical cars one was stopping at 50 percent and then recharge and then moving on its journey again the other obviously was charging up to 80 percent but having a slower charge but having to sort of stop less often right ultimately the 57 percent car was ahead until it came to a charging network where we came to a bunch of charges where four of them were out of order the other two were occupied and suddenly the test was blown interesting um so steve with you know technologies i'm always hearing about new technologies on cars and i've heard about autonomous vehicles and new connectivity features can you tell us a little bit more about these technologies? Yes, obviously, a lot of car, the vast majority of cars today are already equipped with lots of systems that, for example, will help you stay in lane, can keep you a safe distance mm -hmm. from the car in front, will stop the car in an emergency if you don't apply the brakes, things like that. And those are all things that so are on the steer, basically, we need to get us towards fully autonomous cars if we're going to do that. But so I think we're only at level two of five at the moment if that's the left the five levels of autonomy that the, the, the car manufacturers quote we're at level two in terms of the technology so we're, there's some way to go in terms of the technology and again it's the reliability of that technology yeah, we can't, at the moment if, it, if it's an assistance technology if if it doesn't always for example if it doesn't always read the correct the speed limit correctly doesn't matter you can override it if it doesn't read the speed limit correctly and you're completely reliant on it that's a problem so we've got to sort that out first but i think perhaps the biggest thing is is us if we were, as we were at what car we we were used to we were recommending a car a few years back came on sale and it was called Dacia Sandero and it's a great little car comfortable uh, and very cheap really well priced like ten thousand pounds for a brand new car spacious so spacious comfortable and we spoke to the people at Euro NCAP about it the safety experts and said you know worried about it. is it safe though and they said yeah, yeah we can't say anything wrong with this that would cause it to be un to be unsafe when they actually tested it it got two star rating oh it was wow because it didn't have the autonomy as it wasn't because it perform badly in a crash it was that it didn't have this driver assistance technology or at least not to the level that most cars do um, and we were looking at that going oh my god are we recommending a car how are people going to feel about this who bought this car based on our recommendation actually no one was bothered in fact most people were going actually I'm, I'm glad it doesn't have this technology I don't like this stuff anyway so we've really? got to get past that yes. that for each other people yeah. trust the technology people want the technology and that's perhaps the biggest thing we have to overcome before autonomous cars can happen absolutely so say we've moved forward a bit people are trusting the technology the technology is working great how do you see that affecting disabled drivers um, well yeah I, 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 well yeah i, I think the, the the implications are huge uh because as steve says currently yeah we're at level two i think there might even be a couple of level three cars but not in this country i think there's maybe a bmw where you can take your hands off the steering wheel but, yeah, Ford, <laughs> but Ford have as well but yeah again but yeah, the legislation in the uk doesn't allow yeah, it. it doesn't allow it here yet so um so yeah we're still some way away from level five but it, it's when we get to uh, the current technologies we have do make long journeys a bit more relaxing i guess if nothing else mm -hmm. for, for mobility customers uh but it's when we get to that those higher levels particularly level five where things have changed drastically so uh once you get to level five you no longer need to take responsibility for driving the car so if the car can drive itself suddenly right. you can change the design of the car because you don't need a steering wheel dashboard etc so it can just effectively become a room that moves uh so from an accessibility standpoint that's fantastic because you can uh put the door wherever you want to have a huge opening so mm -hmm. that you can easily get a wheelchair in and, and plenty of space to move around etc but also it means that people who currently need someone to drive for them for example they can suddenly go out on their own uh, and right, a whole right. new level of yeah. freedom so so level five is the dream and, and that, that will change you know really drastically change people's lives 
but it is some distance off. There's some quite big problems to overcome before we get there. Okay. Well, let's hope we overcome them quickly. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Steve, let's talk about the environment. Yeah. Now, cars play a big factor. Uh, are there steps that people can take to reduce their environmental impact of their driving? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's where electric cars come in. I mean, I really do. I mean, it's, there's obviously there's debate about how clean they are in terms of, for example, the energy used to charge them, the energy used to create them. There is, you know, they are more energy intensive to make than, than conventional cars. But in terms of local air pollution, obviously, it's it's a no brainer. They 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 absolutely. And I, I, I I think it was really brought home to me when I had, when I had my daughter and uh, and you know she was you know I remember going to the corner shop with her when she was just started walking and yeah you know, I'd never thought about emissions in town before and then you know I was walking along and she's at exhaust height and, okay. and suddenly you go yeah, God yeah <laughs> but in terms of the actual now, there's obviously a lot of debate about how they are in terms of the say the production of cars the production of the energy to charge them that's where we need to have a, a greener energy creation in terms of the country as a whole in terms of the as in terms of the the world as a whole so it's not it's not that's not down to the cars themselves it's more down to the infrastructure we put in so it's, it's all potential but even even now we, where you where there are the higher energy usages in the creation of the cars and the creation of the energy it doesn't mean that they're not there isn't an env environmental a, a benefit from having electric cars there very much is particularly in terms of local air quality gentlemen i have some questions from the audience and Lovely. some of our viewers at home um so i'll go through these what's the best way to charge my ev at home <laughs> it's this really is simple really? answer uh, if you can obviously not everyone can and that and that is an issue if you can charge an ev at home the benefits are huge a because it's just the easiest way to do it you can get home plug it in at night when you get home and you don't even have to plug it in every day as we said i think people get a little bit hung up on range you, you don't drive two or three hundred miles every day okay. most people drive less than 20 miles per day so you could do that for a week and not have to charge your car feasibly but but either way, you can come home and plug your car in on the driveway, and that is the, the simplest, easiest way to do it. And also, home the charges you have at home are a bit smaller and lighter, and they're a bit easier to use if okay. you have difficulties with the bigger, heavier public charges. Um, outside of that, I would say if you do have to charge, oh, it's also the cheapest way to charge as well. Um, but if you do have to use public charges, I would say planning is key yeah. just do some preparation if you know you're going on a long journey just spend it only takes 10 minutes just spend 10 minutes the night before just planning your journey mm -hmm. so i tend to choose my route on google maps or something it's just the way i do it uh, and then i look at services that i might want to stop at and then i just look at something like zap map and see what charges are there get an idea from the comments whether they're regularly working whether they're reliable or not and if there's only say two charges there and they're regularly not working i'll look at the next services along or whatever until i find one where i go okay this service has plenty of charges and generally people have rated them highly uh, and then you've got a good idea that you should be fine once you get there to charge uh that would probably those would probably be my tips it's, it's, not, bad, it's not just convenience to its cost you know charging yes. at home is so much cheaper than using the public really drastically cheaper. if you okay. if you use the public charging network, particularly rapid chargers often you'd be paying more to cover the same mileage as you would with an equivalent petrol car um, whereas whereas if you charge at home it's even on the more expensive rates it's half the cost if you can get a, very, a cheap overnight charging rate suddenly it becomes down to a fraction of the cost and so that's that that's where it starts to really start to pay you in the pocket not just environmentally yeah, gotcha so this is an interesting one why are hydrogen cars not more widely available so uh do you want to do you want to go for this one so there are <laughs> there are several issues around hydrogen cars one it's the chicken and the egg thing for example you know, there is no infrastructure to fill yep. this because there are 11 filling stations for hydrogen currently in the uk at the moment okay. so all the time there's that there's there's that level of there's that level of infrastructure no one's going to buy them and while people don't want them the manufacturers aren't going to go producing them Understood. so that so that is a problem where you make the leap at first but the other thing is actually the energy cost of making clean hydrogen is very high around three times as high as the cost of charging a battery so uh, from an again from an environmental standpoint actually the battery electric car is better at the moment okay now i know this is going to vary um depending on the factors but this next question says what is the real life range on most evs oh it, that it, that does vary hugely because it depends yeah. on it depends on the efficiency of the electric car and on the size of its battery effect among other factors uh the weather affects range the temperature affects range so uh, it's a really difficult question to answer so what I, i'd say what you want to look at is uh first of all the size of the car's battery so make sure if, if you do need a car that has big range go for a car with a larger battery but if you look at places like such as what car they will uh, they test these things and they'll give you the real world range right. so uh, of, of, of their findings um 
But it's hard to put a number on it, really, isn't it? What would so, you say? So we test cars, yeah, we do, we do a range test every summer and a range test every winter. The reason why is because there was a big drop off in the, in the efficiency of cars in the winter. Um, so with a, with a petrol car, it's the same with petrol cars. They're not as efficient in cold weather. You're, you're running the heater, you're, you know, the, the weather just isn't make, doesn't make them as efficient. But it's about a 6% drop off with a, with a petrol car. With the electric car, our test shows that it's about 18% difference in terms of the mileage you'll be able to cover on a battery in winter versus summer. And that's not about really cold weather so the last summer test we did was 24 to 28 group degrees across the day and the last winter test that we did was 10 degrees so we're not talking about as cold as it can get and the colder it gets the worse that would get but even in the winter we were still seeing you know some cars the best cars can do 250 miles the worst were doing 150 miles yeah so again, it's a, a case of doing your research, prepping and seeing what's best for you. It's absolutely that, yeah. Okay. Another controversial question. Oh. <laughs> Are EVs more at risk of catching fire? No. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, I mean, uh, all, all the data I've seen, the answer, uh, uh, Steve might have a different view on this, but any, any studies I've looked at, it's actually the opposite. They're less likely to catch fire. Uh -huh. It's just people are seeing them in the media because it's, it's a topic at the moment. And, and as Steve mentioned in his talk earlier, that people love reading negative stories about EVs for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So as soon as there is a fire that involves an EV, any news Everywhere. publication wants yep. to put that out there because they know it's going to get clicks and reads. But in actual fact no i think that i think the problem is they're harder to put the fire out i think is is is, is the problem but they are they, from everything i've seen they're less likely to catch fire than a petrol you, or diesel car steve if you look at the figures yeah so so petrol and electric cars in terms of the fire risk and obviously there are a lot less electric cars but if you look at the proportion directly proportionate that the uh, petrol and electric cars are about the same in terms of the fire risk both absolutely tiny diesel cars are actually the ones that mo are most likely to catch fire although actually if you look at the fire statistics the vast majority of of car fires are not through the car spontaneously combusting it's through arson oh okay makes sense <laughs> would the grid be able to cope with all the evs uh i interviewed someone from the grid uh, uh and uh, effectively the it was a really long answer but uh, their answer was yes um <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit more complicated than that yeah, yeah, yeah. uh yeah I, I mean my understanding is yes so one of one of the main reasons why is the majority of electric car charging is done at home and the majority of that is done at night and the reason right. it's done at night is because you get cheaper energy tariffs at night now the reason the energy tariffs are cheaper at night is because there's lower electricity demand because people are sleeping nothing's yep. being used right, right? Yep. Um, now as i understand it again this is just purely from the people i've spoken to managing a balanced grid as opposed to one where demand spikes and drops and spikes and drops is much easier so if they can flatten the demand by having everyone charging their electric cars at night that's actually easier for them to manage okay so in some so there's definitely some positives to it in terms of managing the grid but there's there's um difficulties that i don't have the knowledge to to explain in terms of uh, i think local substations and things like that and and, and I, I think there are some issues to be overcome but from my understanding yet yeah, all answers point to yes it's fine <laughs> There are also ways where some potential is going for where the technology exists. It's not on the cars yet, but the technology exists for the ah. car to effectively put energy back into the grid. So if you've got oh. more charge that you need in your car, you complete the journey. Actually, I didn't need the mileage I wanted. I, I needed. I'm done with my my car for the day. You could basically put plug your car in, so it's putting energy back into the grid. You get paid for putting it for giving that back. And we all want that, right? Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> okay. EV car prices are more expensive than petrol cars and diesel cars. When do you see these prices coming down? So the costs I've heard, so they were talking about ba about parity on price. So it basically comes down to the, the powertrain. Um, powertrain is more expensive. Um, and part of the problem is because most things, the more you make of them, the cheaper they get. But actually with batteries, because they do have some precious materials in them, actually the more demand there is sometimes the higher the prices go up for those things and also too sometimes those are not in the most stable parts of the world so so that can also see the price fluctuate but actually in terms of when they're looking at parity so originally they were saying they thought the middle of this decade now they're talking about sort of 27 28 okay when they reckon that you look at parity in terms of the cost of making a, a battery powertrain versus making a combustion okay. hot off the press we just had another question <laughs> coming i think this is our last one which vehicle would you recommend for value for money and comfort? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, and, and I guess it also depends on, obviously, Steve will have a very good view of uh, if you're buying privately. Uh, it's obviously slightly different if you're getting the car through the motability scheme because it, it, it takes, you, you know, you, 
uh, it's all about the advance payments, which are a little bit different. Um, but do you want to maybe answer that from a from a what car perspective? Yeah, I mean, obviously it, it does depend very much on, on on what you want from your car. So, for example, oh. so if you know, for example, if we're talking about electric cars, the electric cars that we'd currently recommend are cars like the the MG4, which is a which is a hatchback that's quite practical very well priced. You've got the Tesla Model 3, which is very efficient in terms of the energy usage, and it has access to Tesla's own charging network, which is among the most reliable and among the most widespread. So it's very good. And then there are also some sort of SUVs like the Smart Hashtag One, the Kia EV6. They're, they're great cars, and say so they're, they're not just great electric cars, they're great cars. If you're going to go beyond that, well, I say there's there are so many good cars out there in terms of, which, but it does say, depends what you're, what you're looking for. If you say, if you're looking for something like an SUV, I'd say, look at something like a, a Kia Sportage, for example, that's, that's a, that's a great car. Um, if you're looking for something smaller, Renault, the new Renault Clio, that's fantastic. So there, it really does depend on what you're looking for in terms of price, in terms of size, in right. terms of whether you want petrol or electric. And I say electric doesn't suit everyone yet. If you, if you can't charge at home, it's, it's not going to save you money. The, the hopefully though going forward so that's what i think that's the crucial thing we'd say to, to to legislators as well looking at this is that actually yes the the problems that we think exist for the most majority of people don't exist because people charge at home unless you're regularly doing more than 200 miles that's a problem but if you there is a 30 percent group of the population who can't charge at home and we mustn't forget about those if we're going to go by 2035 everyone's driving electric yep. we've got to make sure we make we, we don't forget about them we don't just it can't just be the stick to get them out of their petrol cars we have to have the carrot to incentivize them to make sure that they can charge at an affordable rate I think the other difficulty with that question is that uh, uh, comfort as well means different things to different people yes. in terms of whether that's uh, how well the car is equipped. So something like a, a Hyundai Ioniq 5 is, is loaded with tech and at the moment there's some really attractive APs on that. It's a very good electric car with very good range, lots of equipment absolutely worth looking at uh, uh, then there's you, you know you've got comfort of seats which is a, a different thing entirely i mean i don't know volvo xc40 has fantastically comfortable seats i found um i drove a, a citroen c5x the other day the pneumatic suspension very comfortable suspension so there's um you know there's, there's sort of different elements of comfort and they will affect people differently uh my advice would very much be to go out and test drive as many cars as you can i think a lot of people for I, I can understand why because sometimes it's quite difficult to arrange a test drive uh, particularly um, you know if you if the car doesn't have the adaptations you need but I try and get out in as many cars as you can because that's the way you're going to know yeah. but then look, the look at lumber adjustment too because you know, a lot of the stuff we yes. talk about Volvo Volvo traditionally has fantastic seats and if you look at the their new their latest car their, their small electric car the Volvo X30 on the high spec versions of that they also has fantastic seats but then the cheaper versions you can't get lumber adjustment which means on a longer drive perhaps they might think you might not notice on a short test drive yeah. but yeah. actually on a long yeah. distance you start to suffer because Absolutely. you don't have that adjustable lumber okay so i think one of the key takeaways from from our conversation the other day is to do your research absolutely there are many factors to consider figure out what's best for you and, and make a decision based on that definitely okay. and there's so many there's so many resources you've got so many forums and, 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 and websites such as what car to find all this information so brilliant well steve and matt thank you so much for joining me today and for answering all the questions thank you for having thank me. you next up we've got michelle velicott customer support director at motability operations and david fairburn managing director at callum designs and they're here to tell us about the work that they've been doing to address the challenges of converting wheelchair accessible vehicles in an electric world